Hi folks, my name is Michaela. I'm with the Frisco Historic Park and Museum. Thank you for joining us yet again for another virtual lunchtime lecture. Today's presentation will be local author Bill Fountain discussing his latest book, Chasing the Bad Guys, discussing the 19th and 20th century law enforcement uh, in Breckenridge and Summit County. This presentation will take audiences through the formation of the Breckenridge Town Marshals, as well as the, as well as the history of Breckenridge and the Summit County area as a whole. Fountain is considered a leading expert in Summit County history with multiple published books and articles, including Chasing the Bad Guys and Chasing the Dreams, which is all part of the Chasing series. Feel free to check them out at the Breck Heritage Alliance. And without further ado, Mr. Bill Fountain. Hello and welcome. Uh, I'm Bill Fountain. I'm one of the historians at Breckenridge. Uh, we first moved to Colorado in 1987 and bought our first second home up at Breckenridge in 1988. So the first summer that I was out in the backcountry with my four wheel was in the summer of 89. And I got hooked on all the old neat stuff that was out there, mining stuff especially. And uh, every summer since 89, I spend a couple of months at least out in the backcountry, still doing investigative work. And in and, uh, and the off season, I do a lot of research. Um, I've transcribed over 3,000 pages, uh, typewritten pages of original articles, journals, mining logs, et cetera, of Breckenridge from 1859 to 1900. And I have a collection of digitized photographs, historical photographs of about 2,500 of Breckenridge and Summit County. I've co-authored six books in the last 10 years, uh, Chasing the Dream series. Uh, those are all about different aspects of mining in the Breckenridge area. I'm just finishing a new book that'll probably get published later this summer on the history of the Country Boy Mine, which is located out in Prince Gulch in Breckenridge and is a mine tour today. This presentation is a little different for me. Uh, this book is based off of, uh, and excuse me, I've got the wrong screen up here, Chasing the Bad Guys, um, which is a book that came out last year. And it's not about mining. It's about the town marshals of Breckenridge from 1881, the very first one, up until 1923. The book gets into the murders, the robberies, the other lawlessness that went on in town. Um, besides the background of the marshals themselves and their families, um, there's lots of pictures, I forget how many, but lots of pictures uh, throughout the book. And the other thing that's a little unusual about this book is that I, we do some breakouts of major things that occurred during the time that each marshal was in office, such as the disastrous fire in 1884 that came through Main Street in Breckenridge, or the Chinese that were in Breckenridge in the early years. Uh, the Breckenridge Fire Department we touch on, uh, the big snow of 1898 and 1899, telephone service coming to Breckenridge in 1899, building of the new brick schoolhouse in, in 1908, and then the courthouse in 1909, putting in the cement sidewalks in 1912, and lots of other breakouts. So let's get started. The first marshal, 1881 was Sam Blair. He was born in 1844, died in 1932. He enlisted in the Civil War in February of 1864 and was wounded twice. He was town marshal from 1881 to 1884, acting marshal in 1908 and 1912 when there was a short-term vacancy. And he was a night marshal in 1908, which was an equal par with the day marshal. In 1882, he married Maggie Foreman at the age of 38. Unfortunately, Maggie died five days after childbirth with their first child in 1884. The son, Jamie, had some very serious medical issues and actually lived over uh, on the west 
Western Slope with relatives, Sam would go back and forth and visit with them. Um, and he died in 1887 at age three. Uh, an interesting thing in the 1882 Colorado Business Directory for Breckenridge lists Sam Blair instead of Marshall as chief of police. And you'll see as we go through here, the chief of police today is, was the predecessor, the predecessor was the, the town marshal. Blair became justice of the peace, so a judge in 1914. In 1918, the Breckenridge trustees made Blair, the police magistrate. <clears throat> so the first breakout story is on William Myers. He was arrested for high grading on the Yuba dredge. The dredge was a mining operation. This particular one was on the Blue River. And uh, as I think you can see on the left-hand side, the bucket line of the dredge would go down into bedrock, bring up gravels that contain gold. It would be brought up into the dredge and uh, then go through a processing and wind up down in the hull where the gravels would be going through sluice boxes. Well, this fellow Myers must have picked a, a nugget or two and put it in his pocket because he was uh, arrested for, for high grading and that's what they called it. Uh, and there's an interesting story to it. So uh, he was arraigned on a Saturday, a few days after he was arrested, and he was brought to the courthouse. The attorney for the dredge company was there, but Sam Blair, the judge, was not there. The newspaper article that I got the story from said he went fishing with the prosecuting attorney. And the reason for that was that with an all, their, their attitude was, with an all male jury, the accused would not be found guilty as all minors high graded. It was just part of their salary. So why waste a good Saturday? He went fishing. <laughs> I love it. <clears throat> this is a picture of Lincoln Avenue look, looking west, a uh, little different than what you see today and some other pictures. I think I have two or three pictures looking west on Lincoln and you'll see the progress as we go through here. So 1881, you'll see uh, on the right-hand side, there's still a couple of the, the tent buildings. Uh, at the base of that, there would be four or five logs high, and they had framework that would hold up the tent. And that could have been a saloon, it could have been a, a mercantile store, whatever. Early days, and I'm talking 59, 60 after Breckenridge was formed, there were a lot more of these down on uh, Main Street. Most of them were gone by 1881. That's why this is rather an unusual picture. Another picture, a kind of a pano of Breckenridge taken in 1882 that shows the town. A couple of things far there on the left-hand side middle, you'll see where the hillsides kind of washed away. That's where they hydraulic mine. And you can see uh, how the debris from that mining operation flowed all the way down and eventually went into the Blue River. The building with, with a little tipple on top there in kind of the middle is the, uh, the new schoolhouse that was built in 1882. We're gonna see some other pictures of that a little later on. <clears throat> this is a great picture, Main Street Breckenridge looking north, 1882. On the left there, you see the Arlington House, which was a hotel, uh, three or four uh, businesses down. That large one with the veranda out front is the Denver Hotel. Uh, we're going to see several pictures of that later on in this presentation. Uh, that's on the west side of the street. You can see at that time in 1882, the east side of Main Street didn't have many buildings at all. So Sam Blair, this is the family plot. I took this picture last summer. You see one headstone there, it's in Valley Brook Cemetery. The headstone is for Maggie Blair, his wife, that died in 1884, five days after childbirth, and their son, Jamie, that died three years later. As you can see, Sam is missing, he's not there. Uh, I did research on all of these marshals through Ancestor, uh, ancestry. And in the late 18, 1920s, 
Sam moved to San Diego and was in a, an old age home there for a couple of years. And then in 1931, he moved to Pasadena and lived with a nephew. He died in 1932. And I assumed when I saw that, that he was probably buried in Pasadena. Uh, Ancestry didn't have any records of where he was buried. But when I afterward went down to the town hall in Breckenridge to look at all of the, the cemetery records for all of the marshals, um, and when I pulled up Blair, uh, this is what I found. This is the card they have on the Blair plot, which actually has a couple of other people in it. But you'll see there in, in number six is Maggie, number seven is Janie, and number eight shows Samuel. And then if you follow it across, it said cause of death, senile. And then uh, at the far right, it says cremated in California. When I turned the card over, there was a notation on it that he was cremated in California. His remains were sent back to Breckenridge to be buried with his wife. So in fact, Sam is buried with his wife and son in that plot. But there's no headstone for him. And that really bothered me. So I went to the Breckenridge Heritage Alliance, got the police chief of Breckenridge involved, and the three of us, uh, the Breckenridge Heritage Alliance, the police department, and myself put up the money. And as of last month, July 10th, we have a new uh, stone for a headstone for Sam Blair that gives him uh, recognition for being the first town marshal, as well as the police magistrate and the chief of police. And that's what the Blair uh, plot looks like today. The next one, uh, Marshall, I want to talk about, again, we're not going to cover all these. There were 16 marshals between 1881 and 1923. We're only going to talk about a few of them here. Ernest Conrad, in 1882, he moved to Breckenridge and he became a town marshal, or was town marshal from 1887 to 1888. In 1887, he married Lucina Albee. Uh, Albee family was a long time Breckenridge family. They came to Breckenridge in, in 1860 and had claims out by Lincoln City in French Gulch. Uh, they had three children, uh, three girls, 1888, 1892, and 1896. In 1894, Conrad became the police magistrate. In 1895, he was a Summit County, so that was a county, not a town, under sheriff. And in 1898, he was uh, the State Humane Society officer for the area. In, on August 12, 1898, he was deputi deputized as county sheriff, and I'm going to explain that here in a minute. This is Breckenridge, north of it's, it's Main Street, north of Lincoln. This is a great picture. It was found in a private collection. Um, it's really cool because you see on the far left there, the Daily Journal, which was the, what the paper was called in the 1880s. There's their, their shop. Next to it, you have the Churchill photographer. Uh, we have some pictures from Churchill uh, out there today. You see a bakery, you see a furniture store. So again, that's all north of Lincoln. The next one is taken in 1888, and it's south of Lincoln on the east side of Main Street. And you see the district court, a uh, few buildings down, the one with the bell, that's the uh, fire department, and that building had just been moved there recently from another part of town. <clears throat> Pug Ryan Affair. Some of the locals are going to recognize that name. In fact, they have a bar restaurant over in Dillon by that name. Uh, the, um, sorry. On August 11th, 1898 at midnight, four robbers entered the Denver Hotel and went into the gaming parlor with guns drawn. They were after the contents of Robert Foote's safe. He was the owner. He had one of the few safes in the town of Breckenridge. So not only did he have his valuables there, he had a lot of the upper class of Breckenridge's 
valuables there. The, rob the robbers were aware of this and had planned to ro uh, open the safe and get the contents. However, one of these brilliant robbers accidentally had a gun go off and they were concerned about that drawing attention. So they quickly robbed the patrons that were there, including Foot. Foot had a gold watch. He also had a diamond pin on besides cash and other valuables. And the four bandits got away and escaped. Robert Foote immediately offered $100, which was a lot of money back then, for the capture and arrest of the bandits. They somehow suspected, and I never did learn how, that they had headed toward the town of Kokomo up the 10 Mile, mile, mile Canyon uh, toward Fremont's Pass. Um, by the way, this is Robert Foote, owner of the Denver Hotel. Um, and they went to, so at four, oh, excuse me. So the, the sheriff, rather than go after the bandits himself, he deputized Ernest Conrad, since he was a former marshal. And uh, Conrad took the four o'clock AM train to Kokomo. This is Kokomo about that time. You can see it was a substantial town. This is now under the climax settling ponds out there near Fremont Pass. <clears throat> so when uh, Conrad got there, he knew Sumner Whitney, which owned the Senate Saloon, and he enlisted his help in going after the, the bandits. Somebody had, had seen three suspicious fellows come into town and pointed out a cabin just outside of town where they suspected they were. So Sumner and Whitney headed out that way. They went up to the cabin, knocked, they were invited in, they questioned the men, left, but when they were outside, they discussed it and something just didn't seem right. So they went back in and when they went in, Conrad wanted to look under the, the uh, 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 the bed and see what was there and immediately Pug Ryan drew his weapon and shot and killed Conrad. There then became a shootout and uh, ultimately the uh, one of the bandits died uh, as well as uh, Sumner Whitney. So Conrad, Whitney both died, one of the bandits died, Pug Ryan got away. It was four years later that they finally caught up with them in Seattle, Washington. Sheriff Dittlottweiler went there and brought him back. However, uh, they were a little nervous having him being jailed in Breckenridge, probably figured he'd be lynched. So they brought him to Leadville. Um, plus it was cheaper to, to have him in Leadville than it would have been to have him in, in uh, take care of him in Breckenridge. So, uh, but <laughs> Ryan, uh, Pug Ryan and four others broke out of that jail. They used a watch spring saw that was smuggled into them on the padlock and in the middle of the night they escaped. Well, Pug wasn't the most brilliant guy in the world because he went down to Cripple Creek where his sister lived and that was well known. And the authorities found him there a few days later, arrested him, brought him back. He was tried, he was found guilty of murder, sentenced to Canyon City Penitentiary, where he died there in 1931. However, this story isn't over because 10 years later, some kids were playing around at, uh, near the, the old town site um, of Kokomo, and in an old rotten log that was falling apart, they found a gold watch. There's the, sorry, there's the arrest record um, for Scott, which is alias Pug Ryan. And there's the mug shot of Pug Ryan when he was arrested. So this watch was found by some young kids as well as the diamond pin that Foote had been wearing. And uh, people put two and two together, realized it was from, from the, the robbery 10 years earlier and it was returned to Robert Foote. Uh, Robert's
great-grandson, Robin Theobald, has possession of this watch today, and he says when he winds it, it runs absolutely perfect. Here's the inner workings of that, obviously a beautiful piece, uh, gold watch. So getting back to Conrad, he was buried in Valley Brook Cemetery, where uh, I got this picture a uh, winter ago out there. The next marshal is H.F. Uh, King. He was actually called High, born in 1852, died in 1908. In 1881, he moved to Summit County. In 1888, at 36, he married Lily Mangren, uh, which was 17 years old. They had three children, Nesta in 1891, Mildred in 1900, and Rodney in 1902. King was town marshal from 1889 to 1992, again in 1994 to 1900, again in 1990, excuse me, I should have been uh, 1902 to 1904, and 1906 to 1908. What you see there is a two year uh, that he was not between jobs. And that's because the marshals were elected by the town council and they were very politically motivated. So when the majority of the council was Democrat, they voted in uh, a Democratic marshal because the town council were the ones that voted the marshal in. And then when the political swung to Republicans, they would vote in a Republican uh, marshal. So Sam, uh, King was probably one of the best marshals over all of the years. And you can see he was uh, marshal for a number of years on four different occasions. This is an interesting uh, picture. There's actually two of them. This is Breckenridge in 1898. This was one of the times that King was marshal. Uh, it was, this picture, uh, the etching was run in the Summit County paper, newspaper, and I was able to crop it out. Um, it show, this is the south end where I had the red arrow going, shows you where Lincoln and Main Street is. If you look at that uh, building on the, what be the west south corner, that's the Theobald building today. Uh, the next one shows the northern end of town, and you can see all the streets laid out and the nice buildings. Um, and they're kind of in the forward middle, you can see where the uh, 1882 schoolhouse is. The Condon Drewers Affair. So Dr. Condon was the doctor for Breckenridge for many years. He graduated from Univers University of Michigan. And John Drewers owned the Corner Saloon. The two of them were really good friends for a long time. They were actually neighbors, lived on, on Main Street. That was until a rumor had it that Condon was having a uh, an affair with Drewers' wife. On August 4th, 1898, Condon was leaving his office on Main Street and Drewers accosted him. He took a cane and started beating him. Condon warned him he better stop. He didn't. Condon was a crack shot. He was uh, actually won quite a few awards for marksmanship. He drew his 38, fired short four shots, hitting Drewers three times and killed him. Condon went immediately to, to the jail and turned himself in. This is Condon's booking. Dr. Condon, booked for murder by Dittweiler, the sheriff. So the trial was held over in fair play. It was not held in Breckenridge. And as it turns out, Marshall King testified for both the prosecution and the defense. Condon was found not guilty. And because the trial was over in Park County, but it was a Summit County uh, case, Summit County had to foot the bill and it was $655.55. 
some of Drewer's friends, as you can see here, made him a very fancy headstone over in, uh, in uh, the cemetery, the Valley Brook Cemetery, where he's buried today. The next story, again, all of these were when King was marshal. The big show of snow of 1898 and nine. There hadn't been one before like it, and there hasn't been one since like it. It begins snowing on November 27th, 1898, three days after Thanksgiving. On February 4th, the train arrived in Breckenridge and could not make it back to Como. This shows you from Breckenridge looking up on the hillside, a train going with seven engines pulling a train through the snow. So this is a, this, this, a lot of these photographs, by the way, are taken from private collections. So these had never been shown before. Uh, these were taken with a personal uh, little, uh, probably Kodak camera. Um, so this one shows Main Street during 18, early 1899 after the snow had accumulated quite a bit. Uh, town, the road is Main Street totally covered up. It snowed almost every day through February 20th of 1899. Food and more important to some, liquor, newsprint and so forth ran very, very low. Here's another shot. You can see again the Arlington Hotel. You can see the Denver Hotel. You can see on the right hand side the fire department, which was uh, moved there in 1888 at that to, to that location. Another picture of Main Street. Um, and that's actually the Denver Hotel that you see on the right hand side down just a little bit. That's another picture of Lincoln Avenue looking west. There's the Theobald building behind that gentleman in the background there. You can see the snow, <coughs> excuse me, a lot of snow. This is kind of cool. They made snow tunnels to get from one side of the street to the other. It was also kind of a little game that they did just to have something to do probably. So this is remains of the snow tun tunnel uh, April 14th, 1899, when the snow had melted quite a bit. The train finally left Breckenridge 10 days after this pitch picture was taken on April 24th. It was a total blockade of 20, uh, 78 days. The train couldn't get good in or out of Breckenridge. The building of the new schoolhouse. 1908 and 1909. There's the schoolhouse I pointed out in a couple of pictures. It was built in 1882, actually when Sam Blair was marshal, and it was time to replace it. It was just too small. <clears throat> Bonds were sold. Uh, first of all, the voters passed an a, a, a initiative to build the schoolhouse on May 4th, 1908. This is the new brick schoolhouse and uh, bonds were sold to finance the building. The contract went to Ingleton and Mountjoy of Denver, and they began August 1st, 1908. The foundation was completed on March 10th, 1908, and the construction was completed, as you can see here, on February 7th, 1909. Beautiful building. Um, Classes began just a few days later on February 22nd, 1909. This is a picture in 1911 showing the, the school kids out in front. You see some of them in the, in the window of the schoolhouse looking out. And this is another picture I got from uh, one of the Marshall uh, ancestors, uh, Logie Hemingway. We're gonna talk about him, a Marshall, uh, a little few years later. His daughter is the fifth from the fifth little girl from the left, the one that's got her head turned. Um, and you can see the schoolhouse in the background. This was taken in 1913. And finally, the Summit County Courthouse, which we still enjoy today. By the way, going back to the schoolhouse, most of you probably uh, are aware that that's where the Sandra Mather uh, archives are located now and uh, the um, uh, library, the, the South uh, Library is located in that building. So the courthouse, 
again, uh, the, the bonds were sold for building of the courthouse. Um, it passed in uh, November 3rd, 1908, residents voted in favor of building the new courthouse. They sold $75,000 in bonds. On May 1909, the county commissioners approved plans by John H. Hubbard of Denver. In June, the Lad Langer Construction Company of Denver began work at a cost of $37,840 for the work they did. And then on July 30, 31st, which is when this picture was taken, uh, 1909, there was a grand celebration of laying the cornerstone for that building, the local Masonic Lodge in Breckenridge, and then the ritual by the Grand Lodge of Masons of the state of Colorado. Uh, they are marching here um, from the train depot where they came from Denver. And they just marched a little bit further to the location of the site of the uh, uh, lane of the uh, cornerstone, which again, they did July 31st, 1909. It was completed on January of 19, in January of 1910. And there's the picture of it before it's got any of the landscaping or anything done. Beautiful colored picture of the brand new courthouse. There's one little bit more on this story. When in 1909 in the right hand or left hand lower corner, they put in a time capsule. And that was to be opened 100 years from 1909, so in 2009. And in 2009, on June 22nd, that time capsule was opened. Present were representatives from the town of Breckenridge, one representative of the town of Breckenridge, one from Summit County. There were two document experts that were invited up from the Col History Colorado because they were concerned about what to do with it, what we found inside. <clears throat> Excuse me. Wendy Wolf and Marianne Raleigh were there to record the event, both in video and still pictures. Uh, there was a man there hired to open the container. Rick Haig, president of the Breckenridge Heritage Alliance, and myself showed up about 45 minutes after they started, uh, after a phone call inviting us down. We weren't invited to begin with. Um, this is, it was a copper tin. Uh, copper box. Uh, and the problem was it was totally soldered, uh, inspected if there was any kind of trick to getting it open, and there was not. Um, when we, Rick and I got there, they were just going to start, uh, they had discussed it, and going to put a blowtorch to the solder to melt the solder to get the tin, the, the, the box open. And my first comment was, what's more important, the documents that's inside or this tin box? And of course, the History Colorado two uh, experts quivered at that one and said, the contents, the contents. So we came up with plan B. Uh, there was a Bowie knife the fella had, and he tapped it into one corner and then tapped it around and he was able to open three uh, sides of it. And then we lifted it up and gently took out the contents. Now it was interesting because the newspaper from 1909 had a very detailed list of exactly what was inside that container. And everything that was in that, on that list was there the bonds for the courthouse, the current newspaper, business cards from prominent citizens, coins, and much more. There's some of the stuff that came out. There's some more stuff that came out. But there was one thing on the list in the newspaper that wasn't there, and it was a gold nugget. Can you imagine high grading? Whoever sealed that up, would have high graded that gold nugget knowing that he wouldn't have been discovered for a hundred years when it really wouldn't have made any difference. <laughs> How about that? I guess that's really the height of high grading. Uh, the documents, uh, uh, people from the History Colorado warned 
that those any of these that are folded should not be unfolded for a period of about a month. They needed to get acclimated to the, the current atmosphere and so forth. So uh, Wendy Wolf was put in charge of the contents. She brought them home a month later and uh, I actually was in August. I met her over her house and we, uh, she, with my help, uh, photographed the entire collection and then they went on display under glass in the courthouse for a period of time and then we had a new time capsule which I don't have time to get into right now and that was uh, put in so the old time capsule was put into the new time capsule as well as a lot of new stuff and it was put on the grounds in the courthouse to be opened in another hundred years. So Hiram King, again, this all happened to these past few things uh, during his, his, while he was marshal. Uh, on October 27, 1908 at noon, King was on his way home with his six-year-old son and was stricken with heart failure and died on the sidewalk on the east side of Main Street. And he was buried in Valley Brook Cemetery. And this is his headstone. His wife, opened a confectioner and Tabascan store in Breckenridge. And this is an advertisement for that. Uh, this was not uncommon when, when uh, a woman would lose, his, lose her husband, she might go into business. Um, so she had her business after that in town. Uh, she is buried next to him. You'll notice on this that she has a different last name. She died in 1961. She obviously had remarried, uh, but buried with her son, but her headstone is next to King's headstone. The next one, uh, Marshall, we want to talk about is Herbert Vo Vogan, born in 1867, died in 1919 at age 52. He co-owned the confectionery and fruit business called McPhillip and Vogan until 1894. In 18, uh, excuse me, at 28, he married Lillian Hardy, which, who was 20. She was the daughter of Charlie, Charles Hardy, which was publisher of the Summit County Leader. That was another uh, newspaper in Breckenridge in the 1880s. It only lasted for a few years. Uh, the Vogans lost their house to a, the, another disastrous fire in 1896 and built a new house in 1898. In 1900, as a Democrat, he was elected marshal, beating out Hiram King. Remember the story I told you about Republicans and Democrats. Uh, King was a, a Republican. On June 9, 1901, Lillian gave birth to a boy who died four months later. He served as Breckenridge Marshal the first time from 1900 to 1902. Advertisement from the Summit County Journal for McKillop and Bogan. Um, you can see here, that's the, again, the business that he had originally. Uh, Herbert, Her, Herbert H. Bogan, 1895. One of the nice things through uh, Ancestry that I was able to do in a couple of cases is connect with some ancestors. I tried with all of them, and most of my, I, I did get replies just saying that it was a distant relative. They had no pictures, had no information. But a couple of them, Vogan being one of them, I did contact uh, relatives. I met with the relatives. They shared family photos. I have a few in this presentation, a few more in the book and a lot more in my collection that they gave me. So this is Herbert Vogan, and he was about 28 years old in this picture. <clears throat> and that's his wife, Lillian Vogan. She went by Mogi. And this is uh, the wife and the two, uh, the daughter and the son taken in 1895. This was his house. This was a brand new house, uh, year after the fire, where his old one burned down. This cost $1,350 to build. And this house is a retail store today in downtown Breckenridge. So you have the old one, the original, I mean, but look at the, look at the, the windows and everything. There's a few additions there. On the right-hand side, you'll notice here you have an addition, <clears throat> but a lot of that is, is original. Very, very interesting. 
Well, there's a story connected with this marshal, Truman Thompson, probably the best murder story of Breckenridge. John Kennan, uh, excuse me, Truman Thompson murdered John Kennan on Lincoln Avenue. Uh, what came out at Thompson's trial, and he did test, uh, do testimony himself, but through others and him, is that Truman Thompson met Mrs. Shelton in San Francisco in 1899. She was divorced, obviously, from Shelton. They got married in Breckenridge May 1st of 1900. Thompson purchased a business in Breckenridge where both of them worked. John Keenan started coming to, into the store office often visiting with Mrs. Thompson. Thompson found out uh, that Reddy Skiles, a uh, fellow in from town, was carrying notes between Keenan and his wife. Thompson then wouldn't allow Keenan to come into the store. He forbid his wife to see Keenan, and in, uh, again, under testimony, he said, she seemed to think Keenan was it. <laughs> now remember, Keenan, I mean, Thompson is talking to an all male jury, and he's trying to get their sympathy. He goes on to testify, this Thompson goes on to testify, that she wanted to wear the breeches in the family. This is not, was not a norm for those days. His wife left him on August 26, 1900, divorce granted February 19th, 1900. Three days later, right in front of that building that I had the red, red arrow going, Thompson confronted Keenan and told him to draw his weapon. Now, Keenan had a reputation of being a quick draw, and so Thompson wasn't going to give him a chance. He told him to draw his gun, but, he, but Thompson immediately drew his weapon, shot Keenan three times, and he died a week later. Everybody, there were people that saw it. At trial, he admitted he did it, but he again gave the story why he did it. I think you might have figured out by now that he was found by his peers not guilty. The rest of Herbert Vogan's story is Vogan resigned as marshal on January 18, 1902 to go to Alaska to do mining. Mrs. Vogan stayed in Breckenridge with her parents, the Hardys. After returning from Alaska in 10 months, the family knew, moved to Bisbee, Arizona, where they did mining, and he did. And in 1910, they moved to Goldfield, Nevada, where he also worked as a miner. In 1912, they were living in San Bernardino County, California, where Herbert died, <coughs> excuse me, in 1919, and Lillian died in 1945. Logie Hem Hemingway, the next uh, marshal we're just gonna talk about briefly, born in 1859, died in 1923. He was uh, arrived from the, in New York from Glasgow, Scotland, December 26, 1881, 21 years old. His name was James Forth Sight Hemingway, but changed his first name to Logie. About February 8, 1887, so six years later, he returned to Scotland to marry 27-year-old Sarah Augustman. <coughs> Excuse me, just a minute, sorry. Um, Logie returned to Breckenridge with Sarah shortly after their wedding. They had five children, Mary in 1888, Maggie in 89, Gladys in 90, George in 92, and Annie in 97. Logie owned a blacksmith shop in Breckenridge. He became a naturalized citizen March 29th, 1894. <clears throat> this is Logie and Sarah Hemingway on their wedding day. She looks about 12. <laughs> Uh, this is Logie, and this is Sarah, and this is Logie's blacksmith shop in Breckenridge. I got all of these pictures from the ancestors. <clears throat> he was elected to the Board of Trustees in April of 1895, 
and then was acting marshal from January 18th to April 7th of 1902. Sarah died in 1913 at the age of 53. Logie died in Denver in 1923 at the age of 64. Both are buried in Valley Brook Cemetery with their infant two daughters uh, that had died, Mary and Maggie. This is their uh, young, uh, youngest daughter, Annie. The, this picture was taken in 1913. You can see the courthouse there on the left-hand side that was built in 1909. And this is Logie's headstone, and this is Sarah's, and this is their two children that died at a very, very young age, <coughs> and buried in Valley Brook Cemetery. Edward Stewart, again, one of the most popular and longest serving marshals of Breckenridge. Uh, by 1907, at 28, Ed was, Ed was still living with his parents in Kentucky. He had jobs as a clerk, a traveling salesman, and a contractor. By April 1908, he was in Breckenridge, and he was in a play at the GAR Hall. He was working as a miner at that time. It appears he met his future wife, Nesta King, at a party on August 17, 1908. There was an article in the newspaper about this party. Both of them were there, and I'm just assuming that that's probably where they met. Now, uh, Nesta was the daughter of Marshal Hiram King, High King that we just talked about a little earlier, uh, who died in 1908. At the end of August 1908, Ed left on a three-month tour of California, Nevada, and Arizona. In April of 1909, he returned to Kentucky, where his mother died in May. He returned to Breckenridge in July of 1909. Uh, this is Breckenridge, again, looking down uh, a little higher up, but looking down Lincoln Avenue. You can see the courthouse there on the right. You can see the schoolhouse uh, that had just been built uh, there on the left. So a little more on Ed and Nesta King. Ed, 31, marries Nesta King, 17, in August of 1910, in Cripple Creek at her grandparents' house. Ed and Nesta had a son, Edward King Stewart on February 18th, 1913. Ed was a fire chief in 1913. Both Ed and Nesta appeared in many plays. They loved to act. There were just constant number of articles in the paper about, about them. Ed was elected town marshal and city engineer by the Board of Trustees in 1914. He served as marshal continually through 1923. This is the exception to what I talked about earlier as far as the political, the Democrats and the Republicans. Didn't matter who was uh, the, the primary or the controlling interest of the, of the uh, Board of Trustees, they liked it, he did a great job and they continually voted him in as marshal. His starting salary was 90 a month, he received several raises up to $135 a month. Ed was one of the first members of the Summit County Rifle Association in 1915. In 1919, he was given additional responsibility as sealers of weights and measures, an additional salary of 50 a month. At a town a trustee meeting in 1919, the mayor referred to Stewart as chief of police, again, instead of marshal. So there's that chief of police title. In 1920, the county's commissioners approved a bill for $8 for Steward as a deputy county sheriff. He must have covered the basis for the sheriff that might have gone out of town. There's the Denver Hotel again. And during this time period, this happens to be a 4th of July celebration on Main Street. Stewart also co-owned the Breckenridge Coal Company with J.A. Theobald, editor and owner of the Summit County Journal. 1921. This is a great picture looking at Main Street, looking north in 1926. You'll notice on the left-hand side a couple of uh, uh, gas pumps and, and uh, uh, advertisements. Uh, Breckenridge is changing. Cars are coming. You can see a couple of them down the street there. Um, this is Main Street looking south in 1928. And there's the Denver Hotel you can see in kind of the middle. 
in another shot of Breckenridge, Breckenridge, uh, Main Street looking north in 1928. So the rest of uh, Ed Stewart's story in November 1922 election, Stewart ran for Summit County Assessor after the death of William Cahoe. Cahoe. Uh, Stewart, a Democrat, won 378 to 287 for Miller, uh, Republican. So he became the county assessor. A local boy, Tom McKenna, was voted, voted the new marshal by the trustees. Stewart would fill in as acting marshal over the years when necessary. He became a town trustee in 1924. He owned a fac fox farm in Breckenridge in 1928. He died in 1952 at the age of 73. Nesta died in 55 at the age of 62. This is uh, Ed and Nesta's headstone in Valley Brook Cemetery. Thomas McKenna, I wasn't gonna put this in, but it's a very, very sad story about a young man that had an incredibly promising future. And it's the last marshal that I talk about in, in the book. Um, but I thought it was worth bringing up. He was born in Breckenridge, June 27th, 1895. His father, Thomas McKenna Sr., was superintendent of the Blue Hill Mining and Milling Company that operated the mini mine in French Gulch. That is an interpretive site today uh, of the Breckenridge Heritage Alliance, or uh, it's got an interpretive sign out, out on it, so one of the walking trails. He died two months before the young Thomas was born, not in a mine accident. I think it was a heart attack, I don't recall. Uh, his mother, Maggie, operated a boarding house and in 1905 co-owned the Elite Restaurant in Breckenridge. In March of 1906, his mother married Julius Butchek, the dredge master, dredge master of the Tonopah Number no. 2 dredge out on the Swan River. In 1913, McKenna, then 18, became assistant foreman for the Blue River Hose Company. That was one of the fire companies in Breckenridge. He actually had gone to work for them when he was 12 years old. It sounded like maybe pushing a broom around and cleaning, uh, but anyway, became assistant foreman. By 19, or May of 1914, he graduated from Breckenridge High School with honors. He received a scholarship to Agricultural College, now Colorado State University. I was unable to find out if he went there for a short period of time or not. Uh, July 22nd, 1916, he married Lily Pence, one of four others in his high school graduating class. In March of 1918, at 23 years old, he was elected by the citizens to the Breckenridge Board of Trustees. In May of 20, he taught a weekly automobile repair class at the courthouse. His wife, Lily, was the clerk of the county court. On November 12, 1922, their son, son Harold Detlev, was born. Uh, that Detlev is the middle name. In January of 1923, after Ed Steward, became county assessor, Thomas was elected by the trustees at town marshal. However, the minutes of the trustees on May 23rd, 1923, show that a John Custer was to fill McKenna's vacancy of the board of trustees as McKenna had moved from Breckenridge. These were taken from the minutes of the trustees meeting, they published those in the paper. No explanation of what happened to McKenna. In the same meeting, McKenna's final pay for Marshall was approved by the trustees for a half a month. Steward, Ed Steward, was made acting Marshall. There was no mention, again, of the Breckenridge paper of why McKenna had left. However, a year later, there was an obituary in the local paper for Thomas McKenna, April 1924. When he left Breckenridge, he had moved to McFadden, Wyoming for a short time, probably to be with relatives, I would assume. Due to ill health, he was admitted to St. Luke's Hospital in Denver. He died there April 17, 1924 from acute 
dilation of the heart. Services were held at Breckenridge High School, April 21st, 1924, led by the Elks Club. He was buried in Valley Brook Cemetery. Lily, 35, married Frank Stafford, 51, in Breckenridge in 1930. This is Thomas McKenna's headstone in Valley Brook Cemetery. I think it's so sad you see somebody so young that had responsible, responsible jobs and then to have died. So that's the end. I appreciate you attending this. Uh, the book has a lot more detail, a lot more stories, um, and a lot more, just, uh, uh, it's a pretty good read, I think. <laughs> Hope you enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much, Bill. We're so happy to have you here. Um, one question we do have for you is where can we find your book if we're interested in buying it? The Breckenridge Heritage Alliance, you know, with, with the COVID thing going on, I don't even know uh, if the information center downtown is open at this point, uh, but they, they can be purchased through the Breckenridge Heritage Alliance. Wonderful. Well, thank you for being here. We really appreciate it. Um, as always, you're one of our favorite lecturers. So thank you. And folks, we'll see you again next time. All right. See ya.